Today on this episode of The Crossover, we will be discussing the future of medical education with CEO of NYU Langone Health and Dean of NYU School of Medicine, Dr. Robert Grossman. Learn how NYU has trailblazed the way for progressive student finances and revolutionary medical curriculums tailored for the next generation of physicians. Much more on this episode of The Crossover. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking with Dean Grossman from the NYU School of Medicine, talking about the future of medical education. Hey, Dr. Grossman, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm all right. Listen, you know, thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction just while everyone's logging on here. We are fortunate to speak with Dr. Grossman today, who is a pioneer and leader in medical education. Uh, what he's done at NYU is truly remarkable. Uh, as background, he's CEO of NYU Langone Health and Dean of the NYU School of Medicine, which was renamed in his honor in 2019. Uh, in this role, he oversees more than 45,000 employees, students, and faculty. Uh, under his leadership, NYU Langone's revenue went from $2 billion in 2007 to over $10 billion uh, this past year, with an additional $4 billion in philanthropy raised as well. Uh, of note, NYU Langone's NYU Research Awards have totaled over $800 million, an increase of more than 500% compared to 2007. Uh, as Dean of the Medical School, and we'll get into this today, uh, Dr. Grossman has really led historic and unprecedented um, initiatives. Uh, number one is providing free medical uh, tuition for all of its medical students. We'll go We'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. He also curated a new curriculum for the 21st century, which emphasizes clinical training from the very first year of medical school, and also has a revolutionary three-year MD program for select candidates. Uh, most recently, he was the driving force behind the creation of the NYU Long Island School of Medicine, offering full tuition scholarships and an and accelerated three-year curriculum exclusively for those interested in primary care. Uh, his accolades are extensive, being named Time Magazine's uh, one of America's 50 most influential healthcare leaders. And additionally, he was named a living landmark by the New York Landmarks um, Conservancy. Uh, he is a prolific scientist and clinician. He's won numerous awards from the NIH, uh, and he has trained more than 100 fellows, published more than 300 uh, publications, and has written five books. And here today to discuss what is his passion what is the future of medical education? So again, Dean Grossman, thanks for being with us today. Really a pleasure to speak with you. My pleasure. So let's just, just start with background. I mean, you're a very accomplished scientist and clinician. How did you first get involved in medical education? Well, I was involved in it um, and I was interested in it since the time I was a student, yeah, a medical student. and. Um, I think it was an important focus, uh, especially when I became a, a staff person at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, thinking uh, about um, how, you know, teaching actually is a very important surrogate marker for leadership. That if you're a, a good teacher, in many ways you have leadership potential. Uh, I um, like uh, the analogy, Dwight Eisenhower became well-known early in his career because he was a good football coach. And, and that was a surrogate marker because he could teach uh, the students how to play football. And that actually made him a good general. So uh, and being a good educator, thinking about education in a generative fashion, uh, understanding the dynamic in education uh, is critically important uh, as a dean, as a chairman, as a section head, whatever. Now, you know, I had mentioned earlier, NYU has really been in the last 20 years on the forefront of medical education. You guys have so many pioneering different projects that you have done. What do you attribute that to? Well, I, I, I think... Um, we are not an institution um, that, um, that stays still, that's static. We're always looking uh, to improve. We're always uh, looking for uh, the new next best thing. 
I would say, you know, our culture is one of dynamism. And I, I, and I think that kind of starts from the top. I mean, really, it started early 2000s, but then once you took over, it's clear that you guys have trailblazed, and I think that's a real role model for, for all other medical schools. Right. Speaking of those initiatives, you know, NYU, as we're going to talk about, has a tuition-free medical school, absolutely extraordinary. Give us a little background how that's possible. Uh, right. So I was a, a scholarship kid, and scholarship is very important. And uh, if you understand that students coming to medical school, especially today, are uh, living under a significantly adverse financial conditions, and, and they're trying to minimize their expenses, um, they're uh, conserving their, their housing, their food, et cetera. And uh, you know, when students graduate and the average debt is about $200,000 uh, of debt and you from college and medical school, and you combine that, let's say some students marry other medical students, $400,000, $500,000, it's unsustainable. And so um, we viewed that as a moral imperative, that you can't, doctors and educating doctors are critically important to this country, critically important to my generation who needs the doctors. And, and the question is uh, how uh, to improve their financial uh, standing. So the first thing was uh, to create a tuition-free medical school. And uh, it took us 12 years because it's expensive and we were totally focused on it. I had a great partner, the chairman of our board, um, Ken Langone, uh, was also focused on it. He thought it was incredibly important. And uh, over 12 years, it took us 12 years to raise $650 million, which was the corpus to support the tuition-free uh, medical school. In addition, Actually, even before we had a uh, full tuition free medical school, about 10 years ago, we thought that having creating a three year MD program was important. It took one year out, that saved some money. It also moved students ahead, and training, uh, training programs have gotten longer and longer, especially between residencies and fellowships. And so taking one year out of medical training and moving students along uh, was important both uh, in, the t in terms of the uh, time frame uh, and also in terms of saving a year of tuition and expenses. Now, so, so you kind of hinted at this. Do you believe that medical training is too long in this country? Um, I think... Let me put it this way. I, I would say medical school was too long. I, I'm not sure of medical training, but medical school. So we have uh, spent a lot of time understanding um, aspects of a three-year program. This year, uh, our medical school is going to an all three-year program. So we, if students want to stay for another year, they can get a master's degree, they can do research or whatever, but you have the ability to graduate in three years. And we thought uh, the fourth year had become a year basically of auditions for residencies. And, and uh, it was unfair from a lot of perspectives because not our school, but other schools were taking the tuition money and the students were auditioning in other places to get residencies. And, and it didn't seem fair because then you're putting the burden on the families, the students, the financial burden of that year uh, and, and the schools are just taking the money. So how did you cut that year out? It, what, what superfluous material did you guys take out to go from four to three years? Yeah, we really didn't take out a uh, superfluous material. What we did was we made uh, a core rotations in a year and we changed the curriculum. So the curriculum was uh, pretty intense. Uh, and you have all your basic rotations. We were satisfying all the requirements, but we did it in three years instead of four years. And, you know, some of your uh, electives, uh, 
the secondary electives may be gone, but a lot of the fourth year, as you know, um, for many students were rotations on different, um, in, in, in different uh, hospitals. Um, they were, students were uh, going abroad to do uh, service or, or, or whatever. Um, and we thought, sure, that's uh, nice, but uh, the essential part is to be able to finish medical school in three years and have uh, your choices of what you want to do next. Now, what has been your experience thus far? You guys also pioneered that um, accelerated pathway where if someone is an outstanding college student, uh, they can not only get into medical school, but also into residency. Right. What has been your experience with that program? Yeah, that's been a, an enormous success. So that was our first endeavor into a three-year program. So we gave people uh, a choice to apply. So. When you think about it, a lot of students coming uh, to medical school today are very different than when I went to medical school. They're much more sophisticated. They have tremendous experiences. A lot of them really know what they want to do. And so we felt if you really want, knew what you wanted to do, you could apply uh, to medical school and then apply secondarily to get into the residency program. And we opened up slots at NYU for those particular students. And thus, um, when you uh, got into what we call the three-year program, uh, you were guaranteed the residency slot. And that was an enormous success. And we have studied those students, and those students, uh, <clears throat> um, more of them have become chief residents. Uh, they're incredibly happy with the program. They're incredibly happy they did it in three years. And when we studied, uh, was there any, uh, defect or uh, shortcoming in those students, you couldn't, they were identical to the students who graduated in four years. Wow. So, you know, clearly that has had an influence on other medical schools because they're trying to do that down here at Miami. And I know that multiple other schools have seen what you're doing as a role model and they're, and they're trying to emulate. Now, as a program director of a surgical specialty, I'm just going to play devil's advocate. Um, you know, I would argue that it's very difficult to pick appropriate candidates with the appropriate fit, even after four years full of medical school experiences and data. And I would argue this pathway carries the risk in small surgical specialties of having attrition or mismatches. What's your answer to that? Uh, well, we've done the experiment and we haven't seen that. And really? I, I, I would say uh, that there have been a few students who have left. You know, you can count them on uh, the fingers of your hand, um, and especially in our surgery. In their surgery, uh, they have loved the students who have opted in. Uh, and of course, there's the potential. You know, there's the potential that students don't pan out, as you point out, after four years. So, the marginal utility of the <clears throat> one year, I'm not sure, it, uh, really adds much. Agreed. Yeah, it's a it's it's super exciting. We are trying it down here and you guys have the data. So obviously data is what is what speaks volumes. Um, let's talk about objective grading, which in medical school has become increasingly scarce. For example, most medical schools are pass fail now completely. Step one is now pass fail. What are your thoughts on these trends and are we helping or are we hurting medical students by eliminating objective grading? So our medical school is much more traditional. We have uh, grades, particularly in the clinical years. Um, and uh, we also have AOA. Uh, and, you know, our feeling, so if you come to NYU, you're great. You know, I can tell you the average med cats are in the 99th percentile and the grade point average is 3.96. So, so they're great students. They get great residencies. Having said that, uh, the students want to know, number one, how they're doing. And, and number two, we want to know and we want to celebrate the very best uh, uh, performers. And there's nothing wrong with that. Every, you know, it's like everybody here is a winner. But, but it is important to identify and celebrate exceptional performers. And uh, we feel 
that um, it helps uh, students who have to uh, basically confront material. What do you recommend for program directors such as myself looking at students as these objective measures decrease? How do you, or I mean, you know, how would you evaluate students that are coming out of pass fail medical schools, pass step one, no AOA? It's very hard to judge. Yeah, well, that's the problem, isn't it? So the other students are at a competitive, so your program will take a student who's coming out who you know how they perform. So the students who are coming out of pass fail schools and neurosurgery is highly competitive field, right? You have two, three openings, I guess, per year. And you have all these applicants and you say, how do I distinguish them? So I think those schools are doing a disservice to the students to have a pass fail um, and the, to be pass fail and the inability for you in a competitive residency to distinguish their best students. And that's the, that's the side of it that sometimes students don't understand and sometimes medical schools uh, don't understand uh, the ability, uh, what they say, uh, they, they want to decrease stress, but it actually increases stress. If you've worked like crazy to get into a neurosurgery program and you can't be distinguished from the other applicants, that's a disservice in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think if you can't handle the stress of a step one score, probably not going to bode well for your neurosurgical career. Um, so, um, but, but I want to talk about the landscape of medicine, which is really changing at a very rapid pace. How is NYU preparing its medical students for a career in this rapidly evolving field? So for example, the business of medicine, which was never taught and still is not really taught is such a large part of a physician's success, not just caring for the patient, but the entire business aspect. Are you guys evolving your curriculum? Are there, are there resources available for your students? Um, there are resources. You know, uh, we are not emphasizing the business aspect of medicine, honestly, to, to medical students. I think, uh, you know, they, they are, the material that they're confronting is for, ferocious. And, and, and so we are really focused on creating um, and, and giving our students the best education in, in medicine. And, and, you know, the, the business part of it is an aspect of it that um, I acknowledge is uh, important, but I think you can learn that after medical school. Got you. Are there any other evolving parts of medicine that you want to stay on the forefront in terms of your curriculum? Well, we're very involved uh, in, um, and we're in the forefront, I think, uh, of electronic medicine, of, um, of teaching. Uh, you know, we, we don't have a traditional anatomy course. We have uh, prosected uh, specimens and a lot of virtual anatomy, and, and we think our Anatomy course is big, is really superb, um, but we don't. Uh, our students don't do traditional dissection, and we don't have bodies. Um, we spend a lot of time, uh, so students get tremendous amounts of data uh, from our um, from the electronic health record, and they're be, they're able to download. Um, information specific to the patients they're seeing to be able to really ha have a unique patient experience with respect to ed education. Um, and I think in terms of facilities, uh, we're in the forefront of, uh, uh, of every new technology. So the students are exposed uh, to these technologies, which then become standard in five to 10 years. The other thing we try to do is have our best doctors teach the students. And that's very important. Our yeah, because that last part, I don't think many places do that. I don't think necessarily the best doctors teach the students. Right, 
So I'll give you an example. So in our anatomy course, uh, Eddie Rodriguez, the head of plastic surgery who did the face transplant teaches anatomy. John Golfinos, the head of neurosurgery teaches anatomy. Uh, and uh, Robert Montgomery is the lecturer in transplant. So, so, so there, our leaders are our teachers. Yeah, I think everyone has skin in the game, so to speak. And I think that's a huge aspect of your medical school. Um, let's talk about um, diversity, which has been shown to be essential for any successful organization. What is NYU doing to maximize diversity and inclusion throughout its institution? Uh, right. So we take it very seriously. We have an entire institute, uh, the Institute for Health Equity, Excellence in Health Equity and Diversity. Um, which we put together. It's under uh, the um, leadership of Vanga Ogedegbi, who's a great, great leader. And uh, it has a number of pillars. It has an education pillar, a clinical uh, pillar, where we are focused on uh, promoting diversity, getting the highest quality students, training them, uh, having huge community input part of we got a $167 million grant from the Bezos Foundation uh, to promote uh, diversity and um, health equity in Brooklyn. Uh, we have a whole uh, institution, NYU Langone, Brooklyn, which is uh, situated in the highest concentration of Medicaid in the United States. Uh, so we are um, we're all in, uh, in terms of uh, trying to create health equity for all of our communities, all of our diverse communities in, in the New York metropolitan area. That's great to hear. And obviously that initiative starts from the top. So, so again, kudos to you. Uh, talking about the research, you know, NYU is a research powerhouse uh, with over a billion dollars essentially in NIH funding. Uh, how do you dovetail that research enterprise with the medical education? Do the medical students have access to that? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, again, it goes back to having opportunities to interact with our best scientists in, in lectures, in um, uh, forums, in, uh, in study groups. Uh, and a lot of the students who come here have already had experience in research. You know, they're, they're gifted students. Uh, and uh, they have opportunities to do any type of research they want, and they get tremendous exposure. Uh, we created a, a large infrastructure, particularly to do programmatic grants. Um, but uh, research is a cornerstone to this institution. It's been that way uh, for uh, since 1841, you know, we had Salk and Sabin, we've had four Nobel Prize winners here. It, it, it's a, uh, obviously a research uh, institution uh, and research, all types of research are embraced here. Clinical research, basic science research, translational research. Um, and we feel, um, as I said, we feel very proud of our efforts and uh, the research that has been done here that has had a profound effect uh, on the health of our country. Yeah, I mean, I think you guys get people involved early, and I think the early exposure to academia helps groom these future leaders in the field. Um, you know, give us your crystal ball view here, just wrapping up, because I know you're super busy. Uh, where do you see medical education headed in the next 5, 10, 20 years? Give us some major changes that you would envision coming across in the next next decade or two. Well, I, I think, uh, as you uh, alluded to, more schools are going to uh, tend to three-year MDs. So it'll change the whole context of medical education. It'll be a continuum of medical education. I, I'm not sure how... Uh, these uh, pass-fail uh, experiments are going to work. I, I, I think uh, you may see people reverting 
back to uh, more traditional ways, particularly if everything becomes fast fail, the only thing you're going to have maybe are your SAT scores, which are no predictors of how <laughs> Uh, medicine, but clearly you need ways to uh, predict how students are, are going to do. I think um, there's going to be a lot more emphasis on uh, metrics because they are uh, both objective and happy ways of doing things. And, and doctors are, you know, on the one hand, we're going to pass fail. On the other hand, doctors are going to be judged by third parties uh, in terms of uh, effectively grading them. Yep. And um, I, I don't think we're going to, this country is going to accept in the intermediate term uh, a socialized situation. I, I think it's much more uh, about pay for performance. And, and the institutions and the doctors who don't perform are, are going to be pushed aside because they're not cost effective. Yeah. Listen, Dean Grossman, thank you so much for your time. I just want to say what what a trailblazer you and that institution are. For people who don't really know, NYU has really changed the game when it comes to medical school. Free tuition, only three years. I mean, that's amazing with everything you've done there. Again, kudos for really being a role model for all the other medical schools. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the kind words and very nice to meet you. All right. Take care. Have a great day.